So hello everyone and uh, welcome to uh, our very important session of the day, which is uh, somewhere we're going to talk about the future of cloud and certainly, you know, technology has been the mainstay of our um, country in the last two years, more so than it was before, wherein everybody has jumped onto the digital bandwagon in order to be uh, having a business or perhaps sustaining themselves at this point of time uh, to grow themselves bigger later. So Puneet has joined us from Amazon Web Services and indeed he is the president for India and South Asia. And as the country MD, he leads the entire portfolio of AW services. And certainly, you know, cloud is something we have been adopting in um, big bunches in this last one, one and a half year, probably this is the biggest ever cloud adoption I have seen by businesses um, during this uh, period of time, much more than I've ever seen the enthusiasm to be on the cloud prior to this. So I think Puneet is going to really share about us, um, the, the future of business and particularly understanding the cloud more closely as he works with the entire ecosystem of businesses, right from startups to SMEs to corporates, um, helping them in the better digital and cloud adoption. Thank you very much for joining us, Puneet. It's wonderful to have you here with us. Uh, and we look forward to your wonderful insights in the next few minutes. And then we'll move on um, and take some questions from our audience. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ritu. Um, absolutely thrilled to be here at the Entrepreneur and Tech Innovation Summit 2021. And when I heard about the topic, which is technology and cloud as a force to drive innovation, it reminded me of a story. Uh, so I thought I'll start by telling you the story. And I'm sure you had two days of very intellectual debates on innovation. And so I'll lighten this up and start with one of my favorite stories. And this story comes from one of the classic books called The Sun Also Rises. Uh, this is a book from Ernest Hemingway. It's right here behind me. And in the book, there's a character, a character called Mike. And Mike is asked a question in a conversation. And the question is, how did you go bankrupt? How did you go bankrupt, Mike? Mike thinks about it for a bit and says two ways, gradually and then suddenly, gradually and then suddenly. The reason I love this story is because there isn't a better way for me at least to describe how innovation really lurks around the nibbles and nibbles around the edges of an industry, a business, a profession, before arriving suddenly and shaking up long established players and beliefs. We've seen this over and over again. We saw this with BlackBerry. We saw this with the US steel industry. We're we seeing this happen to car manufacturers now. It's happening around us all the time. So enough of, enough of understanding their stories. But what I'll do over the next 10, 15 minutes is uh, try and answer three questions for you. Question number one, if innovation has been around us for the longest time from the days of Ernest Hemingway, what is different this time and why should you and I pay attention? Number two, what is the role of cloud and technology? How can cloud and technology become a force to drive innovation? And number three, I'll, address, I'll end with some, some advice and some ideas for businesses and leaders as they think about technology and cloud to drive innovation. So let's start with the first part of the conversation. I'll give you three reasons for why innovation and technology are different this time and why you and I should, should pay attention. Reason number one, we're now starting to see what we call democratization of technology driven by the cloud. Any of us today sitting in a Starbucks or a cyber cafe in any city in India can access as much compute, storage, analytics as large corporations with millions of dollars of budget you could do till a few years ago. We've all been talking about democratization of technology for the longest time, but it is here now for real. Imagine the unlock for India, 1.3 billion Indian minds can access this technology flawlessly. And that's what, that's what our mission in India is. Reason number two for paying attention this time is speed. I truly believe speed is becoming the new cost. I mean, I used to see digital and technology ideas in my previous life as post-it notes on in CXO offices, and but I saw a limited urgency around these ideas. We then moved to this phase of running a series of pilots around technology and digital, which was great. Uh, all digital pilots were successful, but we saw a limited impact on the ground. That's starting to change now. The value proposition of technology and cloud and digital has never been clearer. And this pandemic was a bit of a dress rehearsal for the new world that we're all entering. And it has now made digital and technology a question of survival. It's not just a nice thing to do for CEOs and CXOs. It is, it is a question of survival of your business. And I'm now starting to see speed and urgency around technology that I've never seen before. Conversations have become very, very real. Digital roadmaps that used to run into quarters and years are now being built and deployed in weeks. One of my customers recently said, we are now starting to behave like the business that we always wanted to be. Right? So that's the, that's the beauty of speed that we're seeing. And reason number three, why we should pay attention this time to technology and innovation. And this is where it gets personal for you and me. 
the age of the average is over. Let me say this again. The age of the average is over. And the age of the average for talent is over. And, this is, this, and that's the reason this matters for you and I. And we're now entering what some people have started to call the great decoupling, which basically means in simple words, technology is starting to race ahead, but many of our organizations and skills are lagging behind. So technology is moving at a fast pace, but our skills and organizations are yet to catch up. With cloud, if you really look at the last few years, what we saw was a move to a world of globally distributed applications and APIs, right? And APIs became the gateway to information. Geography didn't really matter. You could pretty much build applications from anywhere in the world. I'm now starting to see a similar distribution on talent. Businesses today have universal access to talent, right? And most businesses are already becoming virtual businesses or they will become virtual businesses in the next few years, which basically means they can literally build a business from anywhere in the world. They can hire virtually, they can collaborate, they can sell virtually, they can deliver and support, and they can obviously innovate virtually. Being in Bangalore and Gurgaon used to be an advantage over being in, in a more expensive part of the world. But now with work being broken into smaller chunks and the ability to do this virtually across the globe, it's probably not no longer an advantage to be in a, in a Bangalore or a, or a Gurgaon. And talent, if you really kind of look at the, the evolution of talent in India for the last few years, right? Talent had almost become a commodity that you could buy in bulk and combine all of that talent to reach the needed levels of performance. But that's no longer true. I mean, I used to hear terms like, I need to hire 100 engineers, I need to hire X number of people to get this done. That's no longer true. And I'll give you another metaphor to bring this to life. Uh, I'm a big music fan. I'm sure all of you enjoy music. If you hear a succession of mediocre singers, will that ever add up to an outstanding musical performance? A series of mediocre performances will never add up to an outstanding performance. Pick whatever, whatever your favorite music or track is. Even now, when I, when I listen to the recording of Eagles performing live Hotel California, it gives me the chills. And no amount of mediocre music playing on loop throughout the day can make me feel ever like that. Right? And that's exactly what's happening to talent. You and I are now competing with everybody in the world, and there will be a premium to, to be a professional who can drive innovation in this new world. So those are the three reasons why, why I want you to think about technology and innovation differently this time and, and pay attention. Let's shift gears um, and talk about the second part of the conversation, which is what is the role of technology in cloud and how is technology in cloud becoming a force to drive innovation? First things first, let's define innovation because this term gets used and abused all the time. Innovation to me is executing an idea. It's executing an idea which addresses a specific challenge and delivers value for your customers, which will eventually drive value for you and your business. I want to emphasize the word executing because it's not just about thinking, it's about making things happen. Creativity is thinking of new things, but that's not what we're talking about today. Innovation is doing new things. And the path, of, path to innovation is no longer a mystery. And contrary to popular belief, innovation is no longer a free-flowing work of magic that manifests itself organ organically. Innovation today is an intentional process. It takes work, it takes structure, it takes technology, it takes a platform. And that's where cloud comes in. Cloud, and quite honestly, if I look at my, my career, I haven't seen a bigger enabler of innovation than cloud in my life. And the question that I get asked often, very, very often by, by people is, how does Amazon really innovate at this scale, at this clip? And, and in my mind, and I'll give you my simple take on this, innovation requires three things. First, curiosity and ideas. Second, the ability to try a lot of experiments. And third, which is the most important, not having to live with the collateral damage of failure. And what cloud does is it, does, it allows you to do all of these three on steroids. I'll give you a few examples to bring this to life. Let's look at curiosity and ideas. More data is created every hour today than an entire year just 20 years ago. We're creating more data today every hour than an entire year 20 years ago. And what cloud's helping you do is it's allowing you to string together all of this data, which is coming at you from different sources and a different volume and different variety. It allows you to string all of that together and make sense of it, which allows for creativity and ideas to come up organically. And again, if, if I was to put this in, in different words, cloud today is helping us dramatically reduce the cost of curiosity with data on the cloud. Number two, ability to try experiments. In the old world, if you had to try an experiment, something new for your customer, what would you do? And let's take an example of building a new app for your customers. You would typically spend a few month, weeks, if not months, procuring servers and licenses, and you'd have a lot of money that will be needed to even get started. But that's not the real issue. What if this experiment or this app doesn't work? Your customers don't like it. What are you really gonna do with it? What are you gonna do with the infrastructure that you've built and the technical debt that you've built to build this app? 
And that's where, again, cloud and AWS make it much easier. They make it much faster and much cheaper for you to try things. You can spin up servers and build apps in minutes. And guess what? If they don't work, if your customers don't like it, they want you to iterate and do something else, you can spin them down equally fast and not live with the collateral damage of failure. So the cost of failure is significantly lower with cloud and that drives innovation, right? And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it easier for businesses to give their people, their teams, their, their, their ecosystem, the permission to fail and fail well, right? Which means you're learning from these failures constantly and iterating based on what your customers really need. At Amazon, we believe failure and invention are inseparable twins. In fact, I'm gonna quote Jeff Bezos, our founder. And he said, one area where I think we're especially distinctive at Amazon is failure. I believe we are the best place in the world to fail and we've had plenty of practice. Right, so if you, if you think about innovation in that way, which is the ability to come up with ideas, the ability to try experiments and the ability to not live with the cost of failure, that's, that's what cloud helps you do. Okay, so let's move to the last part of the conversation. My advice and some ideas and, and, and three calls to action that I want to leave you with as you think about technology and cloud and, and that as a driver for innovation. Number one, have the will to invent and reinvent. I mean, as businesses, as leaders, as professionals, we all have to acknowledge that we can't fight gravity. I can promise you today that there's somebody out there who's working on delighting your customers at twice the speed and half the price. There's somebody out there who's trying to do that for your customers. And if you believe me around what I said about the, the age of average for talent being over, you and I both need to reinvent both on behalf of ourselves as professionals and as businesses. My second advice, a call to action for all of you, speed is a choice. Speed is not preordained. The ability to move fast is a muscle that you need to exercise regularly and keep it ready for action. I mean, I spoke about speed being the new cost and the speed that we've seen in the past few months driven by the pandemic. I just wanna make sure that we don't snap back to the old ways, right? We gotta keep the metabolic rate on ideas and digital execution really high. And number three, the last piece of advice, if you want to double the pace of innovation through technology, double the rate of your experiments, double the number of experiments you're running and give yourself and your teams the permission to fail. And if you're on, on the cloud, if you're using the right technology and if you're good at course correcting, being wrong may be less costly than you think. Whereas being slow is going to be expensive for sure, both for you and for your business. Believe me, this permission to fail based on, based on how you use technology and cloud can be really energizing. So I started with Ernest Hemingway and I'll end with him. Don't be the character, Mike. Don't be the character who gets disrupted first gradually and then suddenly. Don't wait to get disrupted, either gradually or suddenly. Start innovating today, be the disruptor, and move today. With that, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to take reactions, questions, comments, and, and have a discussion around this. I, I love the advice you gave there, Puneet, uh, about experimenting and not going too slow. It's, it's, it's so, it's so uh, valuable. And I don't think a lot of uh, businesses actually think like that, you know, because everybody wants to adopt uh, uh, slowly and surely, but sometimes that doesn't help by itself. So I think that was a wonderful piece of advice. Um, in fact, you know, we have a question around that. Um, um, so the gentleman is saying that, you know, uh, today, uh, while he wants to adopt cloud and digitization, but they're not able to find the right uh, tech people to help them out. So. Uh, where do you think the problem is? I mean, how, how, how can they get the right people to do it? So I know there's an overall tech talent crunch out there in the market. So what, what are your thoughts on it? No, it's a great question, right? And we're seeing this in India today all the time. And I'll give you some statistics to bring this to life. Today, if you look at the, the workforce in India, roughly 12% of our workforce, Ritu, is, is digitally skilled. And if you, if you wind the clock, the, uh, the clock forward over the next four to five years, we need 9x the digital skills that we have in India today. We need 9x the digital skills, right? So it's obvious to all of us that there is a skill gap in India and we all, as AWS, for example, a big part of our mission is to train people at scale in India uh, and we're working really hard at it. But going back to the specific problem from this gentleman, I would just say a couple of things, right? One, uh, and when I look at customers and, and people who kind of made the journey to cloud uh, more effectively than others, obviously the easier way to do is to go and hire talent. It's no longer easy, I know, um, but that is the intuitive reaction. But people who've done this well are the ones who've really retrained their people. Um, and that I think is just, a, and I've seen large corporations in India and small businesses in India thinking about retraining and skilling in a very meaningful way, which really energizes the organization. And this is not rocket science. This is quite honestly not rocket science. Of course, this is technology and there is a ton of material and we're doing as AWS and several technology companies are doing a lot of uh, content and training around this. Most of this is free. 
I would just say, get started today, start training yourself and your team. It's not going to take a long time. And then over time, you can bring in more skills as you need more and more niche skills. But there's enough and more if you have a good team in place. Um, there's enough and more you can do with skilling uh, and get started. Sure. Um, wise advice there. Um, so another question is, um, uh, do you see hesitation amongst entrepreneurs in letting out or giving out organizational information to uh, someone new or to an unknown service provider when it comes to cloud adoption? Well, that's not true anymore, Ritu, but I think there's, it's, there's a very clear understanding that if you really think about cloud today, right? I mean, it's it's far more secure than, than running your infrastructure in your own data center or wherever you're running it, because we obviously do this at a scale which is much larger. We're obviously very, I mean, security is job zero for us, right? So that's the first thing that we all do. Uh, and it's just, it just, it's really run in a very professional and at scale and in, in the right environment. Uh, in terms of data, the way this works in the cloud is all our customers pretty much own all the data that they have. Um, and we, we don't really access it. We don't have access to it. We don't, uh, it's completely owned. Uh, customers have the ability to encrypt the data. They have the ability to move the data. They can decrypt the data. What we do is we provide a lot of tools for you to really make sure that the data is securely handled and managed and provide a lot of best practices, ideas, guidance, technical help. But the, 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 the ownership for the data is completely with the customers. And, and by the way, if you really see what's happening at scale in India today, AWS is the India's largest and most well-deployed cloud platform. And we have hundreds of thousands of customers in India today who are on the cloud and are moving to the cloud, right? So I think people have now kind of uh, understood the proposition very clearly and, and the security part is very clear now. Sure. Um, another one is that uh, besides compliance issues, what are the challenges uh, that organizations are facing in implementing hybrid cloud solutions? I think um, I think one thing we have to realize is, by the way, my point of view on this, right? In the fullness of time, we will see most applications run on the cloud because the cost proposition and the ability to run this at a scale, at the speed, the, the agility that I spoke about is very clear. But as we get to that future, Ritu, I think there will be a time when customers think about running applications, some applications in their data centers or closer to wherever they are, uh, a lot of applications um, and infrastructure on the cloud, and then also a few applications on the edge, right? And, and you'll see a lot of innovation in that space, right? So that's where the hybrid cloud question, I guess, is coming from. Um, I think we're trying to make it easier for customers, right? So all the work that we're doing with VMware, for example, which really helps us really think about virtual machines, either if they're running in the data center or they're running on the cloud, give you give the customer the seamless interface, the ability to manage the entire environment, apply the right security and compliance standards, irrespective of where you're running your, your infrastructure and your applications. Uh, Outpost is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an offering that we launched in India last year. Again, the intent is to help customers run AWS level uh, security, operational performance and services within their premises, right? So there's a lot of innovation happening in the space. Uh, across both compliance, uh, as the gentleman mentioned, and also just kind of running this seamlessly as you think about moving more, more and more applications to the cloud. Sure. Um, there's another one. Uh, what in your experience do you see, uh, just a second, do you see that the teams are clear on the goals and desired outcomes of their cloud migration? I think I have a, I, mean, I think I have an interesting point of view. I mean, if I look at this, if I look at businesses and, and customers and people who've done who migrated to the cloud in a, in a really good way and really fast, I think they've done two or three things differently. One, I think, uh, as I said, right, they're not fighting gravity, so they're not really questioning themselves on the journey. Uh, they're not dipping their toes in the water. They're really thinking about this in a deep, meaningful way at scale. I'll give you an example of Access Bank, right, which is one of the largest banks in India. They're moving 70% of their workloads on AWS and cloud in the next two years, uh, and they're building the next set of customer interfaces and applications on the cloud. But I think what people are doing is they're setting top-down aggressive goals. Mm -hmm. Right, because and going back to this piece around speed is a choice, right? Speed is not preordained. And if you don't want to dip your toes in the water, and if you really want to move this in a meaningful way, then you have to set an aggressive top down goal for yourself, for your teams, for your business, for your customers, and then move really fast, right? And then once you've kind of set a top down goal, then that allows you to bring the entire organization together, bring the service providers together, and really march towards that goal. I'll just tell you, I think the challenge here Ritu, is not technology. I mean, as AWS today, we can pretty much run any application anywhere in the world on the cloud. The challenge is leadership, the challenge is the, the fear of the unknown, the challenge is the ability to move fast. The challenge is more cultural and, and leadership driven than technology driven. And I'm seeing businesses in India now move really fast. Yeah, I actually read a data point on uh, some McKinsey report, which says that uh, of all the 
digital adoption that starts taking place or the transformation about 3% uh, of only 3% of the companies actually go the whole way, which is like about 100% towards cloud migration. How do you think we can overcome a situation like that? I mean, you know, it, I mean, it's important to go the entire way. Otherwise, it's not going to benefit you to the fullest, right? I'm glad you mentioned the McKinsey research, but I'm, I spent 11 years at McKinsey before coming on, on board to AWS. I know that research very really well. And, and I, I think, uh, one, I will say that, I think that's starting to change. I think that statistic, if you look at the statistic in the next, by the way, if you think about the pandemic and what's happened, it was obviously a massive human tragedy, but it was also a dress rehearsal for, for businesses and technology in India and, and all over the world, right? Which is, we're now moving to a world which is going to be more and more uncertain and unpredictable. Uh, that's one thing we know for sure. We don't know how it'll shape up, but it'll be unpredictable, right? And in that world, Ritu, you need technology and cloud because that brings in, I mean, cloud reacts well to uncertainty. For example, if pizzas are not being delivered and cabs are not running on the streets, you should not be paying for technology, right? You, and that's where cloud really comes in, which allows you to have agility. It allows you to move to a, a cost structure, which is very, which is not capex driven, which is more opex driven. It allows you to scale up and scale down depending on which business, which interface, which customer journey is working, and which is not. So I think the writing is on the wall. I think there's a clear realization that you need technology to come out of this crisis stronger. And I'm seeing meaningful progress, right? So the 3% statistic uh, will move dramatically, I hope as much faster than, than, uh, than we've seen in the past few years. Absolutely, you're right there. I think we'll take one final question. Um, do you think that the future of cloud is vertical? That, that's it. <laughs> no, that's short and sweet, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think and if I was to interpret this and I hope I interpret the question right and I apologize if, if I get it wrong. Uh, but I think where this person is trying to get to is saying, listen, as you think about cloud, right? I mean, cloud eventually is infrastructure as a service, which basically allows you to, to build applications and whatever, whatever customer problems you're trying to solve on the cloud in a very cost agile and a speed and flexibility manner, right? The, everything that I spoke about. I think over time, and I think I agree with this, this suggestion, right? Which is at the end of the day, as I talk to customers and CEOs in India, right? I mean, I need to lead the conversation by solving some of their biggest problems. Right, and which is where the vertical domain context comes in, right? So if I'm talking to a bank or an insurance firm, I need to talk about their customer journey and how can they onboard millions of customers really fast and give them get them to open accounts in less than a minute and give them an interface which is truly flawless, right? So I think that's where I think that that's where we all headed, which is how do we really use the power of technology, the cloud, all our services that I spoke about, and really help solve problems for customers, which really move the needle on business, yeah. right? So it's not technology for the sake of technology. It's technology to solve the toughest problems for your customers and really give them a better experience. So I think this person is right. Uh, that's that's where we eventually headed. Sure. No, I think that's that's fantastic. And Vinny, thanks so much for being patiently you know, taking all these questions that, so that we're pouring in. But, uh, um, you know, we really want to thank you for taking time and being here with us and talking to us about the future of cloud and cloud adoption. And I quite like your point about uh, democratizing technology through cloud. And I think that's that's the key word over here. And uh, that's that's what it's going to take. Now, whether we do it, uh, how quickly or uh, delayed we do it, or how, um, uh, how, you know, how well or how unwell in a way we do it is really up to us. But I think it's, there, there's no getting around it. We have to do it in as a business, as a individual, we need, all need to get uh, used to this transformation and I think the sooner the better. So thank you very much for sharing this.